So good to be together as we kind of wind down our series that we've been working through called Does Prayer Work? Um, question mark. Uh, it's been amazing to talk to a lot of you guys as we've pushed into this idea of prayer and kind of to move, move past the churchy answers that we give to each other of like, of course it does. Yeah. And then dig into the real stuff of like, now yeah, it's just, at times it's a struggle. Like, and uh, what are we trying to get out of prayer? What does it accomplish? What are we, how are we approaching it? So uh, I hope you guys have been encouraged as you kind of push down into the deeper stuff regarding, um, you know, at some level, just talking to our Heavenly Father. But really, it's, it's, there's so much there. There's so much there to talk about and to wrestle through. And so uh, today we are kind of concluding this series by looking at Paul's exhortation uh, to the church there at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 17, uh, it's a super long verse. I'll read it to you guys because I love you. Pray without ceasing. <laughs> super simple. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Um, and so there's a lot here that uh, we want to get into today. We're not have a ton of it because of time, but uh, really kind of taking this idea of, okay, Paul's, Paul's encouragement exhortation is to pray without ceasing. And on one hand, if we were to approach this, we'd be like, ah, no, thank you. Like, I'm good, you know? On the other hand, with what we've learned and what we've discovered and what we've been talking about, like, man, this is really an invitation to something so freeing and liberating and just amazingly loving. And so uh, we're going to wrestle through this today together as uh, we're, we're together. But before we do that, would you guys join me in prayer? Father, we thank you uh, that you're here, that you're working, God, that you invite us into relationship in so many ways. And um, God, as we just are honest before you with kind of the struggle at times that prayer can be, God, we thank you that we have a safe space to do that with you, that you, you know and understand. Lord, you're not, you're not bothered by that. You welcome that. And so, God, I, I pray that today we would just enter into a new level of a relationship with you, no matter where we're at in this room with you, God, that we would sense your invitation to come, to be with you, to draw near to you, and to just be loved on by you. And so, God, we ask that you meet us this morning in our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'll be honest, guys, I know Pastor Mike has shared this as well. Um, when we were talking about this, this thing, this idea for the, the prayer series, and uh, I, I as well, prayer's a struggle. It's been a struggle. It's just weird. Like, honestly, like, I, I, when I got saved, I was, I was 16, 17, and reading the Bible made total sense. I'm like, okay, cool, I'm learning about who God is and the story of God and this whole thing, this whole story of you know, creation and sin and the fall and then redemption and restoration and renewal of all things is awesome. Um, I understood community. I'm like, I don't do this alone. I do this with people as much as I don't like people, <laughs> introverts in the room, uh, right? We grow in this. We grow to become people of love. This is what the gospel does. It transforms us. And so I get that. I understood serving. Like, yes, of course, Jesus died for me. Why would I not give my life back in response? Not because I have to, because I get to. Like, I get to serve. I get to do these things to demonstrate love in a practical way. And so those all made sense. And we're, when, you, when you engage in them, you're like, yeah, this is great. This is awesome. Prayer is another story for me. It was like, okay, I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to, are you, you're here, right? You're listening? You're hearing? Am I, am I supposed to hear something back? Am I doing this right? Like, it's just been a journey, guys. I'll be honest with you. Um, and so there's a lot of great things about prayer that I've experienced, a lot of hard things that I've experienced in prayer. And still, uh, even with this series, talking to you, some of you guys are just like, are we doing this right? Is this how it's supposed to go? It's really difficult. Um, so I love that we just have a space to talk about that. We can just address the reality of this practice of prayer, this way that we engage relationally with God that sometimes kind of feels difficult and weird and awkward and, and kind of we can question a lot of things. So I'm, I'm just grateful for this time. Um, but I want to dig into this because if I was to approach this from a previous view of prayer that I had, especially today's verse, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Again, like I said, I'm like, mm, no, thank you. Like, I'm good. I'm, <laughs> Paul, please don't make that a command. Like, can I do something else? Can I read without ceasing or worry without ceasing? Like, you can do that. Um, he says, pray without ceasing. But how does what we learned previously, and we're going to go over this a little bit, uh, lead us into freedom rather than bondage when we hear this? How does it become a delight to pray without ceasing? What do we experience and what are we getting out of this? So uh, I was talking to a good friend of mine about this, my struggles with prayer. I was really honest with him. And trying to give language to an internal feeling is difficult at times. Um, and so I was describing him, you know, this practical definition. And, and so this is the best thing that we came up with. Maybe you'll resonate with this. Maybe you won't. For me, <clears throat> prayer was the thing we do before we do a thing. Okay? Prayer is the thing that we do before we do a thing. So uh, we sit down to eat meals. 
And in our home, we pray, right? Before we do a thing, we do a thing. We pray. We just take time to acknowledge, okay, God, this food came from you. We're grateful for it. Bless it to our bodies, hopefully, <laughs> even though it's probably not the best thing for us. Just make it do a thing. <laughs> Transform it. Um, we, we just acknowledge God in that moment, right? Before we do the thing, we do a thing. And this is kind of when prayer was. So uh, before we, you know, move into a meeting here at church, we pray. Uh, before I talk to somebody, before I let them leave, I say, oh, I'll pray for you. Let me, let's pray together. Let's do this. Before we do a thing, we do a thing. And um, I would do this. And sometimes, you know, I'll, hopefully prayer for me was intentional. Sometimes it was. Sometimes it was just obligatory. Uh, so hopefully meaningful. Sometimes just half-hearted, honestly. I was just like, okay, I know I should pray, so I'm going to. Um, but, and if I stay in this definition, it's almost like my way of getting God's stamp of approval on whatever I'm about to do. You know what I mean? Like, I acknowledged you, so you're going to bless this, right? Like, and we don't, we don't think that philosophically, but a lot of us live that way practically, right? Well, we got to pray because that way God will, God will do the thing. <laughs> it's often what we practice. And this is where, where, really, when we get down to it, guys, what we practice reveals what we really believe. We could talk all day about right answers and philosophy and theology, but really what we live out demonstrates what we believe about God, about his plan for us and our relationship, all those sort of things. So in my, in my ramblings with my friend of mine, he graciously, lovingly, gently said, hey man, time out. I think, I think this might be more helpful. <laughs> Let me give you an image of what I'm hearing you say. And so he is a super smart guy. He pointed me to a painting by an American artist, Henry Osawa Tanner. Has anybody heard of Henry Osawa Tanner? Nobody. Okay, cool. I didn't hear about him either. I was like, who in the... I don't know. <clears throat> so he pointed me to this picture on this screen. This is a painting by Henry Osawa Tanner called The Thankful Poor. So I want us just to, in the moment, uh, sit in this image for a minute, and I just want you to think about what comes to mind if this is a picture of prayer? What thoughts come to mind as you look at this? Yeah, gratitude, right? It's in the name, the thankful poor. Um, what feelings, though, moving beyond our mind into our, into our hearts, what feelings come to the surface for you looking at this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot here. For me, when I, when I looked at this, I said, man, that is an accurate description. And I gave him words. I said, yeah, this is, this is a thing that we do. We're about to partake of a very meager meal, so we're going to pray. We're going to acknowledge God in this. But it's very formal. It's a thing that we do. Um, there's like a seriousness and a somberness to it. And so, so as, as we pushed into this... Um, there's more, there's more. And especially as we move through the series, like just discovering the more that God wants to invite us into beyond this very formal, obligatory, okay, we prayed and now we can go do a thing. Uh, if this remains our only view of prayer, as far as basically what I, what I have defined prayer as in my own life previously of a thing that we do before a thing, uh, Paul's encouragement here becomes really burdensome. Because, well, Paul, I can't pray without ceasing because I gotta go do other things. You know what I mean? I can't just sit all day and pray. I have responsibilities and actions and things that need my attention, but I can't just stop all these things to pray. So how, how do we do this? Again, we might not believe this philosophically, but we live in it practically, right? So how many of you guys, I, I, we have quiet time in the morning, maybe you read your Bibles, you pray, right? And then we go about our day. And if you're anything like me, you get two hours in and you realize, man, I, for the last two hours, I have totally not even become aware that God is actively working or, or around me, right? If someone was to ask me what I read this morning, I probably would just say the Bible. <laughs> like, I totally forgot. I've been so caught up in all these other things that I totally was oblivious to the fact that God is with me, right? This is at least where I'm at. I don't know about you guys. This is where, this is where a lot of times I live. I get distracted by all these other things. Luckily for us, as we've, as we've moved through this series, we've discovered a more expansive invitation, a more expansive view of what prayer is and could be as we talk about God. And, and, and Pastor Mike has defined it for us as this relationship, our relationship with us, communication, 
with God. This is how we defined it uh, on the first week. This is in the first message of the series, we define prayer this way. An awareness of his presence, acknowledging him in the natural, relational ways, and then through that practice, a deepening trust and a confidence and a knowledge of who he is. That moves us way beyond a thing that we do before the thing into, into a deeper relationship, right? It's, it's, it's recognizing on a moment-by-moment basis that God's here and he loves me and he's near. This pushes our ideas about God to the forefront, though, informing not only what prayer is, but how we go about it. And so as I talked with a friend of mine and we were discussing this, uh, and this idea of an increasing awareness of God's presence and work in the world, and a response to it. That's what prayer is. It's a response to an increasing awareness of God's presence actively in the world. He pointed me to a different picture uh, that I want to share with you this morning by the same, by the same author, Henry Oswald Tanner, called The Banjo Lesson. Uh, this, is, this is the picture here. Uh, and I have to be honest with you, when he showed it to me, I started crying. Because there's something here, church, that resonates with my soul. Of this is what I want in prayer. I don't want the table. Yeah, exactly. Intimacy. I don't want the table between us. <laughs> and so I just want to, I want to do the same practice with you again. I want you to look at this picture. What thoughts come to mind? Yeah. What, what, what feelings and emotions float to the surface as you sit in this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nearness. Connection, yeah. Church, I want to just take a moment in silence with this. And if there's something in your soul that you need to say to your Heavenly Father, I just want to make space for this. So looking at this image, in the, in the, especially in the context of prayer, if there's something in you that you need to just say to your loving Heavenly Father in the silence, in the quietness of your own soul, would you just do that? Now. Man, it's, uh, it, really, it really messed me up when I saw this, and it, and it transformed my view of prayer into what we've, what we've talked about, and a, res- a response to an increasing awareness of his presence, right? These... This is nearness. This is connection. And so I'd like for us to consider this uh, today. When we talk about praying without ceasing, it's not stopping all of our activities so we can acknowledge God. It's, it's actively participating in what he's doing, increasing in awareness and responding. So I want to work through this. I want to work through this this morning, this this idea of praying without ceasing as responding to an increasing awareness of his presence and work in us and around us. If you're taking notes, a few things. Uh, First of all, it means praying without ceasing means increasing our awareness of God's presence in the world. Praying without ceasing means increasing our awareness of God's presence in the world. Uh... I've found myself praying this way before, maybe you have too, of praying that God would come <laughs> and meet us. God, God come and, and meet us. Come be here, come move here, come closer, uh, which desire of our souls, absolutely. But the reality is he's already here. Amen. Theologically, he's, he's not distant. We don't, we don't come and gather together as believers worshiping a deist God who created the world and walked away. We as believers here, here celebrate the incarnation, that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, that, that he, he couldn't get close enough. He said, oh, I'm going I'm to come down, and, and in, in the person of Christ, the Son of God modeled for us the heart of the Father with skin on, and he walked among us, and he healed, and he taught, and he loved, and he comforted, and then he was crucified died and was buried. And three days later rose, conquering death on our behalf. And then what happens? And then he gathers his, his boys together. He says, all right, guys, I'm out of here. 
But the beautiful thing about this is, is look, before he leaves, he says this, I'm not leaving you as orphans. Yes, I've loved, I, this has been amazing, and I'm going away to, to finish this work. <clears throat> but I'm not leaving you. I'm sending you another helper, another comforter, the one who's going to lead you into all truth, the Spirit of God that dwells inside of us as believers. And the thing about this is, he says, okay, this Spirit of God is going to empower you to go out into the world as witnesses of who I am, in, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth, the South Hills, Missoula, and to the ends of the earth. I am with you doing a work. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm here with you working. Uh, there's a beautiful book that was written a bazillion years ago, 16th century, by a man named Brother Lawrence. Uh, he, was a, he was a cook in, in a monastery, and he wrote this book called The Practice of the Presence of God. This guy's doing normal, ordinary work, making meals, serving people. But in this, he discovered a secret that God is present and working, and he's growing in his awareness of the fact that God was there. And this is what he writes as an encouragement to us. This is his instruction on us. If we want to grow in this area, he says this, Think often on God. By day, by night, in your business, and even in your diversions. He's always near you and always with you. Do not leave him alone. <laughs> he's, he's always there. He's always just, just continue to, to practice setting your mind upon the fact that God is there. And in that, engage him. <laughs> Don't leave him alone. Talk to him. Tell him about all the things. Just share, enjoy the fact that he's there in his normal, everyday life. I love that we get to gather together and we worship together and it's awesome on a Sunday morning. God is just as present in your job on Monday, church. He's just as present there. He's actively working there, right? He's at work all around us. And the beautiful thing about it is as we pray, we become more aware of that. And as we become more aware of that, we find ourselves engaging and responding in prayer more because we see it. We see him moving and working and doing things. In this, in this life of praying without ceasing, this invitation to come and, and to, to engage more and more, to respond to God's presence, we begin to see things as they really are. What do I mean by that? I was, uh, I was a kid, I was 19, and I had this wild idea to marry the most beautiful woman on earth, right? And so I'm, I, I tell my dad this, and my dad's like, I love you, dude. You don't have a job. <clears throat> Never stopped me before. So he says, hey, you should, probably, you should probably get into a trade, bro. I love you. You need a job, homie. So <clears throat> I get a job as a, uh, working for a t as a towel setter with this guy. I was an apprentice. I remember going to his house the first day, and he had this truck. That was just decked out. It was so red. He took the bed off and put like a utility bed on there. He had like the ladder racks. This thing was like amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And I was like just blown away. I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, right? I left his house that day. I saw 50 billion of these trucks driving around town, right? Now, like did people just like go out in that moment and buy a bunch of these trucks? No. They had been there the whole time. But I was just oblivious to them. My position <laughs> made me aware of what was really there the whole time. And this is what prayer does. It, it makes us aware of the fact that God is already here working. Amen. And as I begin to engage God more in prayer, the more I become aware of the fact that he's working and doing things around me that I was oblivious to before, which then in turn helps me to engage more in prayer in response to his work. Does this make sense? We get to see things as they really are. The reality is God is present and working in the world we live in. Prayer increases our awareness, which in turn increases our prayerfulness. God is present. Now, I want to go back to this picture. Jay, can we put that one back up, dude? Thanks, man. Um, I want to sit in this for a second again, church, because I want you to, I want you to put yourself in the position of the young guy sitting on his grandfather's lap. He's aware of presence, right? He, he's doing a thing, he's, he's playing, he's learning. 
But in all of it, he's aware that, that, that his grandfather, is the one who loves him, is near. What do you think he is experiencing in this moment? Do you think he's afraid? Do you think he's worried about messing up? No, he's like, I'm good because the one who loves me is near. Where are my grandparents in the room? Grandparents, raise your hand, raise them up. We got them, yeah. You guys all came to the nine. There's more, there's so many here. What do you think this grandfather's experiencing right here? Do you think he even knows there's a banjo in the room at all? Probably not. He's just enjoying this moment because there's nearness. There's closeness. I don't care what goes on on the banjo. I'm just here with the one I love. Then that's all I care about. This is prayer. The enjoyment of nearness. The reality that we can do a thing together, but man, the goal of this is just we're close. <laughs> and we're becoming more and more aware of it. If prayer without ceasing means responding to an increasing awareness of God's presence, in and around us. Secondly, it also means the invitation to participate in what God is doing in the world around us. We don't just become aware. We, we receive an invitation to come and participate, right? As I go to work on Monday morning, as you go to work on Monday morning, as you go to school on Monday morning, right? God is doing something there. You see a coworker, a, a fellow student who's going through a hard time. The reality kicks in, hey, maybe God's doing something here. We're invited to participate. Sometimes it's just by praying. Sometimes it's by lifting this person up to the Lord and just saying, man, God, can you just work in this situation? I don't know what's going on, but you do, and we trust you. Maybe that's the only work we get to do. Sometimes that's it. Other times as we pray, we sense the invitation to come and do something about the situation. We receive a deeper invitation to come and be the practical hands and feet and move toward that person, right? In prayer, we discover that God wants us to participate in the work that he's doing. Sometimes it's the work out there, right? The work around us, the things that he's doing. If his, if his presence is around us and it's active, it's doing something all the time. We get invited at moments to participate in that work around us. Paul talks about this. I love this. Uh, the church at Corinth, man, these guys, they're like, they're trying. First Corinthians chapter 3, they are so caught up in, in the celebrity culture. I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm a Paul. I'm a Peter. This whole nonsense. Paul writes this letter. And he's like, listen, dudes, you, you lost it. Listen, <laughs> I planted, Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Apollos watered, right? We both had this role in what God was doing. We did our jobs, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who, nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Guys, we're just conduits, <laughs> Paul says. We're just servants. We're just doing what God calls to do, but it's him. The, he's the one that's doing something in all of it. Fix your eyes on him, not on us, he says. We're invited to partner with God in what he's up to in the lives of other people. But this is the beautiful thing about it. God can do two things at one time. And so as he invites us to partner with him in what he's doing in the world, he's also doing a work in us through this through the situations we find ourselves in, through the moments we think, God, I don't know what I'm doing here. He's like, yeah, we got this. <laughs> We're together. You're close. Okay, let's go. He's doing something in us. Romans chapter 8 tells us that this work is, is, is the act of being conformed, being transformed into the image of Christ. As he's at work in and through us, he's at work forming us into the image of his son. He wants us to act and live and move more like Jesus. And so as we go about our lives, he uses situations to bring those areas to the surface. And in prayer, we discover this. God, search me and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Jesus, you put your finger right on it. That's the area I want to work in. And so in that moment, we yield. God, I, I just pray that you, you do something. Help me, to, lead me to next steps that I can take to partner with you in this work that you're doing in me through this. And this is where it gets hard because he doesn't just use the good things of our lives. Thirdly, if you're taking notes, um, praying without ceasing means that we get to repurpose the painful parts of our lives. God uses everything. He uses all of it. And the parts that we might not like or want to go to, he's like, nope, that's, that's one of the tools I'm using. 
to shape you, to mold you, to help you know that I'm near. How many of you guys have painful parts of your lives? <laughs> yeah, the nine o'clock, no one, like, like two people raised their hand. I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever, guys. Me, me and the one other person that raised their hand. We all do. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we all have stuff in our lives that hurts. Because we live in a fallen world and we're fallen people. We don't always get it right. And we cause harm just as much as we receive harm. We live in a painful place. And so we, we can easily say, well, God, uh, you know, if we just get rid of this, then, man, it would be so much easier. Paul, Paul gives us a great example of this in 2 Corinthians 12. Um, he talked about it in verse 7. He says, man, I, I have this thorn in my flesh. He doesn't get into the details of what that is for us. He leaves us in the dark, which is fine. Thanks, Paul. Um, he says, I have this thorn in my flesh. I want you to look at the practice that he engaged in. Them. Not, not just the theology, but the practice. He says, I have this thorn, this painful part of my life. He said, three times I prayed that God would take it from me. He was aware that God was near, that God was working. And he's like, God, I got this painful thing. Could you just do something with this? Let's fix this. What is Jesus' response to him? God's response there, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says this. He says, hey, bud. He didn't say, hey, bud. I said, hey, bud. Hey, bud. He said, hey, bud. Hey, bud. My grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because my power is made perfect or complete in weakness. Uh, can we go back to the picture, Jay? I was thinking about this as I looked at this verse, as I contemplate this, I look at this image, and I think, man, Jesus, if you just fix this, this painful part of my life, if you just take this away, man, the stuff, the stuff we could do, I could play on my own. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have to have you holding the banjo up for me and, and telling me, oh yeah, maybe not that one, try this other one. I, I wouldn't have to, to lean on you or sit on your lap. I, we, could, we could play all kinds of stuff all over the place. If you just fix this part, I wouldn't be so burdensome to you. If you just, if you just fix it. And in reading this, God's response to Paul is like, Paul, that's not really the point. <laughs> the point isn't that this young man gets off his grandfather's laps and goes and plays concert halls all over town. The goal is that you're aware that I'm near and that we're doing this together. So even in the painful part, what do you think, man, if, if, if this was just gone, maybe that's the place God wants to meet you the deepest. That he says, I know it hurts, but my grace is sufficient for you because I'm near. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. The goal isn't, isn't <laughs> what did I write down here? It's almost as if God's primary focus is a relationship that frees us for dependence instead of freeing us from dependence. He says, if the goal is a relationship, I want you close. And I'm going to come close in the painful parts. Paul gets into this later uh, in Philippians chapter 4, talking about, about anxiety and anxiousness and worry. Um, how many of you guys worry? A little more than the painful people, okay. <laughs> it's fine. I worry all the time by, for a lot of reasons. One, my personality and family of origin. Two, I just have a lot of worrisome things. But Paul says this. He, he gives us this, this instruction on what to do with worry. And because of time, we're not going to dive into the theology of anxiety and all that stuff. I don't, yeah. Paul gives us a practice. He says, he says, don't worry about anything. Okay, Paul, thank you. <laughs> Rad. What do we do? In everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God with thanksgiving. Be thankful. Communicate. Talk. Why? 
Why, how can I be thankful? Because God's near. Because he's there. He's aware of your situation. And he wants to draw closer. Meaning he wants you to become more aware of how close he actually is. Because in worry, I just get overwhelmed with this thing. And because I'm more real than the fact that God's here. But I love this because if you're like me and you're prone to worry, this painful part of my life that I'm like, man, God, if, if I just get rid of the worry, man, the stuff we could do. Because in reality, I'm, I worry without ceasing. So take that, Paul. I worry without ceasing. But what if my worry was actually an invitation into prayer? What if every time I worried, my response was, all right, Jesus, you're here. You're here working. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. I'm grateful because you're near. How would that transform my life if every time I worried, I did that? It'd be pretty radical. My worrying without ceasing would then become praying without ceasing. So the goal in this, in church, uh, as, as we kind of wind down, I want us to get practical. How do we grow in this? How do we become people who pray without ceasing? How do we become people who, in all the daily activities, are becoming more and more aware that God is there as well? We don't stop our activity. We are becoming more aware in our activity that God is there. Helpful things. First, dedicated space for prayer. If I want to grow in something, I have to practice. I have to make time I have, to, I have to engage in some way. I have to carve out time to make space, a dedicated space for prayer. So I have found this practice incredibly helpful as somebody who struggles in prayer, uh, something that has been called fixed hour prayer, right? Um, if you're like me, you have a phone on you, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and you live by a calendar, right? I have, I have this meeting and then I move here and I have to talk to so-and-so. And, and so I've put in my calendar reminders that will pop up at nine o'clock at noon at three, that just say pray. And it's a helpful way for me to remember the fact that God is near, that God is working and active, and he's inviting me to become more aware of it. And so in that moment when that reminder pops up, I just say, oh, cool, okay, yep, I respond. And as I've done this, I've found myself praying more and more regularly without the reminder because I'm growing in practice, right? The early church did this for the first 300 years of existence. They lived by this rhythm. Tyler Staten, in his book, Praying Like Monks, Live Like Fools, uh, talks about this. And this is how he summarizes our encouragement here from our friend Paul. He says this, My suspicion is that when the Apostle Paul instructed the church to pray without ceasing, he had in mind both a constant state of interior being and an outward, committed, concrete rhythm. If I want to become a person who does the thing, i got to start doing the thing. <laughs> right? If I want to be able to just constantly find myself praying, I should probably practice a regular rhythm of prayer. The second one, this was incredibly mind-blowing to me, uh, especially as someone who finds themselves busy. Are there any busy people in the room? You're not in pain, you're not worrying, but you find yourself busy. Is anyone? No, please raise your hand again. I want to see you. I want to know that I'm not alone. We're busy people. We live in a busy world. We move from one thing to another very quickly. Right. At the end of the day, you realize, okay, I think I did something today, but I don't know. But now I have to get my kids to soccer practice and at some point feed them a meal, right? We're constantly going from one thing to another. This practice, uh, an ancient practice called statio, in which before I start a thing, as I end one thing, before I move into the next, I stop and I acknowledge that God is there. I just take a quiet moment to say, thank you, Jesus, that this thing that I just did didn't kill me. I'm about to move in this new thing that hopefully is not going to kill me, right? Jesus, thank you for the energy to move from one thing to another. Thank you that you met me in this thing and I accomplished it and I did my best. All the, just a moment before we start something new to acknowledge God. The bonus of this is it slows us down. We're not finding ourselves rushing from one thing to another to another. All of a sudden, it's been hours before we actually acknowledge that God is there working, man. It's, it's a regular rhythm of acknowledging and becoming aware and responding to God's presence. Thirdly, third practice that I found incredibly helpful is the practice of gratitude. The practice of gratitude. I can go my whole day totally unaware of what God is up to and slide into bed at night just barely alive. Or I can take a moment before I slide into bed and say, man, God, I just want to 
I just want to look back on my day and reflect on the ways that you met me. And I just want to say thank you. What is one thing today that you're grateful for? As we begin to practice gratitude, we become more and more aware throughout our days of the things that God is up to, and we respond with gratitude. We respond with thankfulness, like, oh, God, you met me in that moment. Thank you. We begin to build a habit and a rhythm of acknowledging God's presence and responding to the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, knowing that he's using all of it to form us into his image. I'm going to invite the worship team up. As we close, um, this, is, this is the most helpful advice. As I wrestle with this whole thing, I read this quote. It was incredibly freeing for me. This is what I want to leave you guys with. Pray as you can, not as you can't. We can sit in stuff like this and talk about prayer and think, man, I'm so far away from where I should be. And we allow perfection to get in the way of progress. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Right? Do not become discouraged. It's easy to do, but just take one step. Take one step. I, I'll leave you with this. It's so funny. My good friend and I, we were, we were eating lunch together. We were talking about prayer. And, and he was in a vulnerable moment just sharing some stuff. And he said, man, I resonated with my heart. I was like, am I doing this right? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I, he's a newer believer. And he said, I... When I pray, he said, I say bro a lot. You know what I, you know what I responded? I just said, dude. God wants us. Is that out there with a checklist like King James language? Check, okay. No, he wants you. I, lo- I love reading through the Psalms, the vulnerability, the honesty that the psalmists pray. The stuff you're like, I don't think you can say that to God. Yeah, you can. Because it's nearness. It's relationship. He wants, he wants who we really are. He delights in us. Even if we say bro or do during prayer. He's like, yes, this is awesome. I love this. Pray as you can, not as you can. Church. And I love the fact that we are celebrating this, talking about this on, on the day of Palm Sunday in which Christ comes into Jerusalem and this massive group of people becomes aware of who he really is. They've been with him, they've seen him, they've heard things. But in this day, they're responding to this awareness of welcoming him in and saying, Messiah is here. The one we've been waiting for this whole time is finally here. And church, this is what we do we, in response. We acknowledge, we become aware, and we respond to who Jesus really is. Because of him, we can come. Because of what he's done in dealing with our sin and dealing with our shame and dealing with our brokenness, everything that would separate us from God, he dealt with and invites us to come. As, as messed up as we are, he says, just come. My payment was enough, just come. So let's do it. Father, we thank you that you're here, that you're working, and that you meet us. God, you don't, you don't leave us distant. You come near. And you want us to come. You want us to become more and more aware of all that you're doing in us and around us. So, Father, I pray for those in this room, Lord, that, that we would do that. And that will lead to a life of praying without ceasing. God, that we would see you working, that we'd respond. Maybe there's some in this room, Jesus, that don't know you. They don't know this love, this amazing love that draws us. God, I pray that right now you would break through all those defenses. They would see your sheer delight in who who they are. That all their sin, all the faults and failures you've paid for, they're on the cross and resurrected, proclaiming life over death and inviting us to follow you. So God, I ask that you meet them right where they're at. Father, that we as a body would surround them, come alongside and walking together in an increasing awareness of who you are. So Jesus, we give you this time as we respond to you. Just in love, I pray that you fill our souls, Lord, and just spill out of us. Help us to become aware. In Jesus' name, amen.